So I will talk about the recent work, which is joint channel plumbing and data transmission in Udiflex metal system. Uh, first, I'll give you some background information. And as you all know, we have already seen the rapid growth of mobile data traffic, and there will be an eightfold increase between 2015 and 2020. And there are several key technologies such as SA Panel and Ubiflex are used to boost the data rate. And especially in massive panel, the super can scales linear with the number of antennas. However, there is a big challenge, which is uh, CSI collection. Uh, CSI collection is required to achieve micro multiplexing gain. And on the other hand, the so CSI production incurs a large overhead, especially in the case where you have small protest time and you have a lot of users and antennas. In that case, uh, you will have uh, you will have to spend a lot of a lot of time to do the CSI production and you have a limited time for the data transmission. Hence, uh, there is a, a significant bottleneck for micro systems. Uh, let's talk about the existing CSI production method, which is called the prop data transmit policy. Um, as you can see in this figure, um, so the whole channel for hands time is divided into two stages. The first stage is used for CSI collection, and the second stage is just for data transmission. And there's a clear border between these two stages, because we want to avoid the, the self-interference self as a base station. And also, as you can see, the first stage is actually the overhead of this system, and that limits the throughput, and also this overhead scales linearly with this number of users. Here's an example how we can do this. So we have two users, each of these users will just take time to send public signal to the base station, and we assume that the channels are, has a positive, uh, reciprocity. So the base station now knows the channel to both users, and then the base station can use this channel uh, to do the user file to send the packets to these two users. So there's a natural question. So is it possible to somehow bring the border between these two stages to achieve a higher throughput? So also is positive. Here's the opportunity offered by Fuduplex. So let's look at this example. So for the first one, we have two users, one base station, and one user is sending public signal to the base station, nothing new. And for the second one, uh, the base station has already known the channel to the first user, let's say Alice. And now, uh, let's say another user called Bob uh, can, tra can transmit the, the public signal to the base station. Because in, if the base station has the full capability, uh, it, it, can use, uh, uh, it, it can use some uh, can, uh, interference cancellation mechanism to cancel the self interference. Uh, and, and so I think there was uh, uh, bidirectional transmission or uplink and downlink transmissions. And for the final one, the base station knows the channel to the both of the two users, and then the base, base station can use multi-user Bible to send all these data packets. Now we have two key questions. The first question is how to leverage the full best opportunity to improve throughput. And then the other question is how much is the gain offered by the full well, I'll first talk about some related work. So the first lab work is an experimental work. So people has uh, designed several uh, interference cancellation mechanisms to implement Fuduplex. And furthermore, researchers have also implemented the Fuduplex multi-antenna uh, micro base stations. And here's a lot of theoretical works focused on this area. And note that the first work called uh, the uh, continuous feedback channel. It is the idea is quite related to ours. However, the authors did not consider the, uh, the, the interference caused by uh, the, the interference here. And our purpose in this work is just to uh, solve the scheduling problem. So let's start with the, the system model. So our focus is the, a single cell body user downloading system. And we have one base station which has uh, full blast capability with a lot of antennas. And also we have a lot of users in this cell, and each of these users are hard to blast, is hard to blast, and only one antenna is equipped in each user. And we have random packet arrivals to each of these users. And, the, and for the channel model, we assume that the channel remains the same within one time slot. And 
also in this case, one time slot is equal to the, the channel for S time. And one such time slot is further di divided into k minute slots for polling and transmission. And we assume that we have unit polling and transmission rate within each of these mini slots. And note that the transmission can only happen if the channel is already known to the base station. So here's the big question how to manage the interference. As we can see in this figure, uh, we have two users here. If user one is in the interference region of user two, then there will be uh, there will be some interference caused as a user one. So the user one cannot receive the data packet from the base station. So in which case we will need to organize these users into groups. So we assume that all these n users are divided into uh, i groups such that there is no intergroup interference. And also, we assume that I, the group number I here is a finite number independent of n. And this model is valid because uh, uh, the power at the base station is much larger than the power at the users. In which case, the user's interference range will be much smaller than the cell radius. In this case, we assume that the group information is already given. Uh, and this problem is still very challenging. So now we are ready to describe the, the, the scattering problem formulation. So first I will define the scattering factor, uh, which is f, which is equal to u1, u2, up to uk, which means the base station will prompt the channel to use the ui in i's mean slot. And how to calculate the, okay, the rate received by certain user ui under this uh, scattering factor f, Know that the, this rate is nothing but to count the number of times slots in which that the base station prompts, uh, prompts choose to prompt uh, the, the channel to a user which is in a which is in a different group. Otherwise, let's say if the base station tries to prompt a, uh, the channel to a user that's uh, in the same group, that will box the, the downlink transmission to the user UI. So here in this figure, we use the red mini slots to denote the time slot where the base station prompts the, the channel to the to some user in the same group. And apparently, all these red mini slots are not cannot be used for downing transmission, as the rate of uh, UI is just to count the number of all these uh, green mini slots. And in each time slot, the scheduling policy is just try to. Uh, uh, determines the scheduled factor f, and our objective here in this problem is to maximize the long-term throughput region. So note that uh, the scheduled factor has a lot of uh, decisions in, in these uh, vectors because we all need to decide uh, what this u1, u2, up to uk, all these values are. So you have made uh, multiple decisions in one time slot, and actually all these scheduled users, they are actually coupled with each other, both in time and interference. And also the ordering of all these users doesn't matter because you end up with uh, completely different rates. Here's a quick example, there's a group formation, and here's two orderings you have, and they have completely different rates. And that's also why the classical scattering results are not ideal, because in that case, we only have one decision in each time slot, so we don't have this kind of uh, problems. So, although, so for here, we know that this problem is challenging, so how we can uh, reach our goal? We are trying to maximize the, the weighted sum. So our goal is to find the, the max weight scattering, and also we want to approximate the maximum weight. This is the case where in the in the classical scattering problem where we need to deal with the Q length and the inference, in which case we can implement a, a maximum weighted matching or something like that to do that. However, if we add the time ordering, then this problem becomes much harder. So it needs a new framework for the scheduling. So here's the result outline. First of all, we will propose a through option policy which can stabilize every arrival vector within the uh, capacity region of Fujifilm. And next, we will propose a, a grading policy which can stabilize two thirds of the optimal throughput region. And also, that grading policy also outperforms any uh, 
policies on the half defense. And for the third part, we are trying to characterize the, the full defense again over half duplex. Okay, so first of all, let's start with this longest two lens first based search policy. So in this policy, our goal is to find the next width schedule. So we have this fact. So these are the user selection factor, which determines the number of users that you will choose from each of these groups. So obviously you will choose the users with the longest two lens. What is the best ordering? Actually, it's the longest QLS ordering gives you the maximum weight. So given that fact, the only thing you need to do is just to traverse all these possible user selection factors, and you can get the, the max weight schedule. And thus, the, this policy is super optimal. So compared to the brute force search, which you will need to go through all kinds of these permutations because of the user ordering, here you only need to go through all these possible uh, factors. So it's like a dynamic programming fashion. So we have a very huge uh, complexity reduction. However, as you know, the, the complexity of this uh, LQFS policy, when the number of uh, groups I grows very high, so there will still be a very high complexity. So there's a question, is there any simple policy with smooth throughput? The answer is positive. Here we propose a greedy policy called the MGG policy. So first of all, I will define the marginal gain. So the marginal gain, delta UFJ, is defined to be the weight difference caused by adding user U as the J element of the scheduling factor F, assuming there are no future scheduled users. And our marginal gain based greedy policy runs as follows. First of all, we will sort all these students, all these users, following the, the QLS descending order, and then for each iteration, we will evaluate a, a user that has the next longest QLS, and if it's marginal gain positive, then we will add this user to the, to the schedule factor, and otherwise we will just skip this user and continue to evaluate the next longest, uh, the next user. So the complexity of this algorithm is uh, n log n, which mainly comes from the sorting operation, here's has uh, a theorem which says that uh, this reading policy actually stabilizes two-thirds fraction of the op optimal throughput region. So here's how we can uh, prove this. So we want to prove that for each time slot, the weight of our reading policy is no smaller than two-thirds two of, of the maximum weight. And we further divide the proof into two parts. And we have step one and step two here, combining all these two steps. Have this result. I'll just skip the remaining proofs. And here's another uh, proposition which says that the two thirds approximation ratio is actually tight in terms of weight. And here's this is a quick example shows that that uh, there is a, a, a scheme which can achieve this uh, two thirds approximation ratio. And finally, we have the third theorem, which says that the throughput region of this greedy policy is no smaller than the optimal throughput region under half duplex. The intuition behind this is that the weight of our greedy policy is actually no smaller than the maximum weight under half duplex. And next, I will talk about the, the full duplex scan on the passing region. So here, we, we add some more assumptions. Um, first of First of all, we assume that we have symmetric arrivals, uh, which means the uh, arrival rates are same. And then we assume that the group size, they are identical. And also we define alpha to be the k ratio. And here we have the, the, the two duplex scan. And here are some uh, insights. First of all, this alpha ratio is actually the dominating factor. As alpha goes to infinity, there's actually no big gain regardless of i. Uh, as, uh, as you can see in this, this figure down here, so as alpha goes to infinity, then the, the time slot that you will use to do CSI collection is actually very small compared to the channel compressed time. So that's nothing we can do under this region. Uh, if uh, alpha is uh, smaller than one, then actually the, the full duplex gain could be close to two when the number of groups goes to infinity which also matches the 
potential gain of the food duplex. For the student, for the student inside, uh, if we fix the group number, the food duplex gain will go will go down with uh, increasing alpha. And for the first, uh, for the third part, if you fix uh, the alpha, and the food duplex gain will go up with increasing i. So that's it. imagine that if you have uh, infinite number of groups, which means that you all have no such interference. Yeah. Obviously, you want to be better. So here are some uh, simulations. And um, we plot the average QLens here. And as you can see, uh, the, the blue curve, and the, the blue curve is actually the, um, the greedy policy we have. And the red one is actually the max weight schedule. As you can see, um, as alpha becomes smaller, there will have a larger Again. And for the second point, uh, our breeding policy is actually very close to, op to the optimum. And for the second part, uh, we, we, we did a simulation for some uh, for the random group assignments, which means that we fix the group number, i equal to 4, and each of all these users, they will just has uh, equal probability to be assigned to each group. And yeah, in this case, we call the the CDF figure here, and we can see from this figure that our breeding policy is uh, robust under different group assignments, and also in uh, typical scenarios, and uh, the full duplex scan is more than 44 percent. And here's the conclusion: uh, first of all, we design an efficient algorithm to search uh, maximum schedule, and then we develop a low complexity policy to achieve good throughput result. And finally, we characterize the food duplex scan of uh, the competitive region. And that's all for my talk. Uh, any questions?